Reproducible builds for trustworthy binaries. Helping detect vulnerabilities being injected in the build process, Raboof will tell you about it. Please give him a round of applause. Thanks very much. Yeah, I would like to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about reproducible builds, which I am a huge fan of. Uh, but before we get into what reproducible builds are, uh, maybe let's first talk about who they are for. Um, and I would say reproducible builds are both for developers and for users. And I'm using these terms like in the loosest way possible. So a developer is any person or group who builds something and then distributes binary somewhere. And a user is anybody who gets a binary from somewhere and wants to run it. Um, so I will talk, uh, take the developer perspective first and I will return to the user perspective later. And the goal from the developer perspective is um, that you want your users to uh, use the binary, and you want the binary to uh, do what you intended it to do. Uh, so you wrote some code, uh, and then uh, yeah, you hope that the binary that the user runs corresponds that to, to the code that you wrote. Um, so reproducible builds isn't a specific technology or tool. It's more like a technique, uh, so something that you can apply to all kinds of different ecosystems, uh, and we will look at a couple. So you might say, why is this not obvious? Like, I'm a developer, I build the thing, I package it up, we know how to sign things and ship things to the internet, and users know how to check uh, signatures. Uh, so what's the problem? So the problem is the build step. So, so this is the super simplified version of the software supply chain, right? Um, and what reproducible help, builds helps you with is uh, checking that no foul play happened in the build step. So the build step um, could be happening on the developer's machine, or it could be help, uh, happening on some CI system. Um, and as we all know, because we are at the hacker camp, machines can get hacked. So if that machine is hacked, whoever has control over the machine could inject some malware into the binary at that point. And because at the build step is where you sign the binary, yeah, you will sign it with malware included. So signatures don't help for, for that purpose. Um, so, okay, it, of course the uh, pipeline in reality is not so simple. Uh, we, um, as an input to the build, there's not only the code itself, but it's also the libraries that the code depend on, and also the plugins you have for your build system, for example. So in reproducible builds, we all assume that that is all right. So we assume the code has no malicious stuff in it, and we assume, we assume all the, uh, the uh, dependencies of the build uh, are also okay. So here's, there's a bit of a chicken and egg thing, or turtles all the way down. Um, at some point, you want to check that those uh, libraries and uh, build tools you're using are also malware-free. And that's outside of the scope of reproducible builds itself, but it's also something you want to do. So the core idea of reproducible builds... Ah, so does this actually happen, you might ask? Like, this sounds like a really niche thing, so hackers putting things into your build process. Uh, but actually, I think this, this is a, an increasingly... Um, um, sensitive part of the uh, uh, supply chain, uh, supply chain, uh, software supply chain. So in this example uh, um, from a while ago, 2018, uh, someone hacked the Jenkins machines from which uh, Homebrew was uh, being built. And in this case, they then, when they were on the machine, they stole the credentials. But you could very well imagine that once you have uh, access to the Jenkins machine, yeah, it's relatively easy to uh, make changes to the build process and inject malware there. And it's easy to imagine that those kinds of machines get hacked because nobody really likes CI, right? Or actually, I really love CI. I love that it's there, but nobody likes 
managing and updating those systems and keeping them uh, as safe. It's, it's not a fun part uh, of the development process, and especially if you're in a team. You can definitely imagine uh, a holes falling through there. Um, so because we cannot be perfect, what do we do to mitigate the problem? And that, that's where reproducible builds come in. Um, so the core idea for, for reproducible builds is that instead of building it once and shipping it, uh, you build the same code twice. Um, and the idea is that uh, those two builds are as independent of each other as possible. Um, so ideally they are on machines who are managed by different people or at least different credentials. Uh, maybe they can um, have a different operating system even depending on uh, what kind of thing you're building. Um, and then the second build, it doesn't need to ship the entire binary, but it could also ship an, uh, at the station that says, okay, I built this, and the hash of the resulting binary is something like this. Now, why would you do this? If you have done this, and at the end of the story, as a user, you check that what was shipped is exactly the same as the thing that came out of the other build process, then you can be a lot more confident that no malware was injected. Because if they're exactly the same, if any malware was uh, injected, then it would, m must have been injected in both the build processes. And because those build processes are completely independent, the chance of those build two build processes being, uh, uh, both being hacked is a lot smaller. Make sense so far? Um, so, and that's actually also where the uh, logo uh, comes from. So basically the top dot represents the code, which is the, uh, a single unit. Then the two build, uh, dots at the middle are the build steps, are the two independent machines who build the code. And then hopefully they arrive at exactly the same dot at the bottom. So that's pretty cute. And this is a little bit different from other, uh, uh, other uses of the words reproducible builds. Um, so in, in the case of the reproducible builds projects, we're really talking about the end result is bit by bit the same. Uh, in some other context, you might see reproducible builds in just, it was possible for me to build this code again, which is also very use, uh, uh, useful. Uh, but in, in reproducible builds, uh, the reproducible builds project, we mean we end, end up with exactly the same thing. Uh, and that means um, it is easy to check that it's likely that there's no malware in, introduced. Um, so one example is a project that I've been working full time on for a while, uh, is the Akka project. And this is a Java project. So in the Java ecosystem, what you do is you upload your jars to Maven Central. Uh, so there they are. But how do we know that we haven't shipped any malware in these jars? Well, because we did the work to make sure our builds are reproducible, um, after a release, usually on my laptop, I do the build again, and I see if I get exactly the same hash. Um, and it, it, this turns out in practice, this is uh, uh, definitely possible. Um, and it's really possible to also do it on pretty diverse machines. So we've had releases where uh, the locally built one was uh, made on uh, Linux and someone else reproduced exactly the same binary on a macOS machine. Uh, so that, um, yeah, that, that makes, uh, gives us a high confidence that nothing was injected in the build process. So then you might ask yourself, OK, but why wouldn't some software be reproducible? Um, so, so compromised build, uh, uh, build infrastructure is, of course, one thing we protect against. Uh, but why is this not a trivial problem? Well, it's not a trivial problem because um, in practice, we don't have a habit of really thinking about all the things that can be non-deterministic in a, a build process. Uh, so I'll give some exa examples of it. And sometimes it's actu uh, it actually reveals uh, uh, some pretty subtle bugs. Uh, in other cases, it's just random um, things that are non-deterministic that's just nice to iron out. Um, so an ex example of uh, so, uh, a bug like that is um, there was a project which uh, created a random seed for every build because it wanted every... Uh, uh, every user to have a, a, a different random uh, number uh, uh, progression. 
uh, and it accidentally did that in the uh, while building instead of while installing. Uh, so that was a kind of significant security problem because that meant that everyone who took the same binary uh, would get the same random numbers. Uh, well, what you would want is everyone to get different random numbers because you want random numbers. Um, so that's an ex example of a bug that you could find by uh, applying reproducible builds to your build. Uh, other common things you see would be uh, build timestamps. So if you have a, a timestamp uh, in uh, your build that says, OK, I built this at this and this time, uh, of course, if you build it at another place again, then you get a different timestamp. Uh, a common way to solve this is to use the, uh, instead of using the build time, use the time of the latest commit that you're building. Because that's actually what you want to know. You want to know where this code came from and not at, that mo at what moment that you build it. Uh, and a convention on how to do that is to look at the source date APAG uh, environment variable. Uh, so the conventions would be that you put a reasonable but uh, static uh, or predictable date in there, and that all your tooling would pick that up and use that date instead of the current time on the clock. Another common thing we see is that file ordering is different, is uh, not consistent. Uh, so that's usually easy to solve by just sorting the list. And there's all kinds of other things. There's like uh, hash, uh, hash implementations that are different based on the um, a machine you're on, uh, the uh, uh, binaries could be different because you're on a different locale, in a different time zone, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And now there's also additional advantages to having your builds reproducible. Um, so if you have the nice property that uh, the same code always results in the same binary, uh, in some cases uh, this also makes uh, caching much, much more efficient. So there are build, system, uh, build systems, such as, I think, Bazel, um, which, that will see if some code changed uh, but leads to the same binary, uh, that will then not rebuild any dependencies on that thing that it could see was the same. Um, so if your build was not reproducible, it would ha have a cascade of actually unnecessary builds. Uh, but if your code uh, builds reproducibly, that, that whole subtree does not need to rebuild every time, which is very nice. Um, okay, so say uh, you set yourself the goal, okay, I want my build to re be reproducible. You build the same code twice, and you get a different binary. What do you do? Uh, a very useful tool in this case is Diffoscope. Uh, and that's actually a, a project that came out of the Reproducible Builds uh, project. Um, and that's a tool that will show you, you give it to, two binaries and will show you the differences in those two binaries, like a diff. Um, but it actually knows about a shit ton of formats. So if you're comparing two zips, then it will not say, like, these bytes are different than these bytes, but it will actually give you a useful uh, difference, like, OK, these timestamps or these orderings or these files inside the zip have these differences, uh, which is very helpful in quickly determining what is different uh, between the two binaries. Um, another thing you can use is a build info file. Uh, so that's sort of a convention in the reproducible builds world, is to not only produce the thing you're building, but also produce like a separate file in which you record a lot of information about the system on which you build. Um, and there you would typically also include uh, information that shouldn't impact the uh, binary, um, but might in pathological case cases. So then if you see in the wild two binaries that are different that you didn't expect to be different, you could look at the build info metadata to see, okay, um, this difference is, uh, I see the pattern that uh, this, um, uh, it always looks like this on macOS and looks like this if it's built on Linux, for example. And then you have a uh, easier, uh, yeah, you, it's easier to know where to look. Um, 
So, so I think this, th these are the main uh, reasons you would care about reproducible builds as a developer. So you get more confidence that what you're sending to your user is actually what you intended to send to your user, which is nice. Um, but it's also, of course, useful to the users, because they want binaries uh, without malware. Um, but we can go a little bit further than that, actually. So we can identify two types of users. Uh, there's users of closed software, and there's users of free and open source software. So for users of closed software, there's really no way to verify for yourself that your vendor has used reproducible builds. Uh, best you could do is ask them if they do it. And I, I think this is going to get much more popular in the, uh, in the future. Uh, so if you look at, for example, the, uh, the Salsa uh, guidelines that um, um, a group of companies, I think including Google, are uh, setting up, uh, they're making, reproduce, uh, making recommendations on how to set up your pipeline. Uh, and they have four levels of how mature you are in that. And if you want to be Salsa level four, then you need to do reproducible builds, or just, or you have to have a really good reason not to. Um, so at some point, you might ask your vendor, okay, uh, can you promise me that you are uh, that your maturity in your su software uh, supply chain is uh, at least Salsa level four? Uh, and to to be able to say yes, they would have to uh, at least look into reproducible builds, which is which is nice. So like, do it. Um, but I think where reproducible builds really shines is on the free and open source software side. Um, because there it's really sort of superpower. Um, because for the developer, OK, it's just the developer who builds uh, the same thing twice and looks if it's the same thing. But in the case of open source software, you can also build the same thing as a user or as a user community. and. Um, that means if you have audited the source code, you can now also independently verify that the developer, uh, that no one, that the binary actually corresponds to that source code. Uh, and I think that is, that is a huge deal, because that uh, reduces the attack surface by an enormous amount. Um, because you can independently verify that the binaries are OK. Um, this uh, rules out, for example, blackmailing uh, contributors or contributors who have been away for the project a long time and their credentials got stolen uh, or coercion or all, all these kinds of um, uh, attacks. Uh, suddenly, you don't need to worry about them at all anymore because you can independently verify that um, uh, the, the uh, binary actually corresponded to the code. So, so I, I think that is uh, uh, um, a huge deal. So now we come to the point in the presentation where I have to tell you I lied a bit. Um, it's not, not just developers and users who care. Uh, there's actually another big group who cares a lot about reproducible builds, and that's distributions. Um, so Linux distributions and, and other ones. Um, these typically sit kind of between developers and users. Uh, they often build the uh, software on behalf of the developers for the users. Uh, and that makes the, the distributions li like in the ideal spot to uh, leverage reproducible builds uh, to verify that uh, the end result is actually correct. Also, distributions typically have a lot of infrastructure and a lot of contributors. Um, so it's kind of the perfect use case where you um, um, properly securing all that infrastructure is super hard. So having the extra insurance that reproducible builds gives you is uh, extremely interesting for uh, distributions. Um, so a lot of distributions are really active in this. In this. Uh, Debian has traditionally been a huge driving factor of the reproducible builds project in general. Uh, they have a bunch of packages that are already dis, uh, dis, um, uh, reproducible. Uh, there's good work going on uh, also making the live images, the, the ISOs, reproducible. Um, one thing that is, that is kind of a theme is what's missing in the reproducible, what's often missing, missing in the reproducible builds um, ecosystems uh, is a an easy way for users to do that verification. 
Um, so an easy way for users to uh, consume attestations by other users that they have re successfully reproduced the project. Um, that, that, that is definitely, uh, uh, in many cases, uh, open research. So Debian has a sort of uh, um, uh, experimental plugin for APT uh, that can uh, check reproducibility attestations, but this is definitely not, uh, um, definitely not something that is in common use or actually re practically usable right now. Um, Arch uh, has a bunch more tooling in this, this respect, I think, uh, but like Debian, they're not really there yet. There's some core packages that are still uh, uh, need some work. Um, OpenSUSE is uh, great at upstreaming work, so they're also very active. Uh, NixOS is uh, a Linux distribution that I'm personally a huge fan of. Uh, what I like about it especially is that you get very stable dependency trees, which makes it really reliable to achieve, uh, relatively easy to achieve reproducible builds, um, because you know exactly which versions of your dependencies you will get. Um, it's, much, uh, um, it's much less likely that you will get differences in your build because you happen to build it with a different version of a dependency. That's just because of the way Nix is set up. Uh, that is all, the, the inputs are always very consistent, and that makes it a lot easier to make sure the outputs are consistent. Um, so Nix has some tooling built in to check reproducibility. So with just this one comment, Nix build dash dash check comment, you can check uh, that the, the binary that is uh, in the binary store uh, actually corresponds to something you built locally. Uh, almost all of the installer is reproducible, uh, but also in NixOS, um, actually consuming attestations by other users is something that's uh, definitely a research project. Um, so one very interesting uh, uh, development here is Trustix. So they try to be a sort of a proxy which can, uh, you can inject rules into which can verify uh, the existence of uh, attestations. Uh, but it's not in a. Uh, it's it's not something you can use right now. But it's it's super promising, I think. Geeks is also uh, very active, uh, similar in, uh, to Nix in the sense that uh, you can uh, uh, be certain that your dependencies are uh, uh, consistent. Um, also has. Pretty interesting tooling, so Geeks Challenge can, uh, is a command with which you can, uh, in one go, check the reproducibility of a whole, basically a subtree of uh, a package, which is uh, cool. Um, and they are also a forerunner in bootstrappable builds, um, which um, um, bootstrappable builds is a, a sort of a sister project to the reproducible builds and deals with the uh, fact that, aside from the code, we also need to trust uh, the compiler and the uh, dependencies and stuff like that. Bootstrappable Builds tries to make that, um, uh, to make sure that that is not too much dependent on binary blobs. Um, so bootstrap Bootstrappable Builds tries to bootstrap your environment as much from source as possible, so without relying on binaries. Um, which is very interesting to look at. Uh, Afteroid, the popular Android uh, package store, uh, is also um, uh, also does a lot of reproducible builds work, uh, but is currently not really fo uh, so, uh, uh, surfacing that in the API. Uh, sorry, in the in the UI. Uh, I think they're definitely interested in uh, doing that, but uh, yeah, there's only so many days. Uh, uh, hours in the day, of course. Uh, Tails is the ISO is reproducible, uh, but it is, has to be manually checked. Um, yeah, so that's a bit of a whirlwind tour at where different projects are with reproducibility. Um, so if you ask from like, okay, what's next? What's what are the next steps? What are the most important things to work on for reproducible builds right now? Um, for users, definitely, for closed source things, ask your vendors. Um, ask them if they're uh, using techniques like this, like this in their supply chain. Um, for open source stuff, uh, see if your favorite package is reproducible. Try to reproduce it if there's any instructions. Um, 
if there's nothing there, maybe just try it, run Diffoscope on it. It's, um, there's a lot of tough nuts to crack, but there's also a lot of like low-hanging fruit. So if you find something easy, um, uh, starting with reproducible builds could be a really nice way to start contributing to a package that you're, uh, that you're using a lot. Uh, just ju so just build it twice, run Diffoscope, and see if there's, uh, yeah, you can make sense of what, uh, the, where the differences come from. As developers, of course, try to reproduce your own projects. Um, I want to shout out to this uh, uh, um, uh, GitHub repository. Uh, I probably didn't backdoor this. Uh, this gives you a sort of, um, takes you through a Rust project and shows you how you would make re reproducibly create an alpha binary, a Docker image, an Rs package, um, and sort of shows you in practice what that looks like, so you get a more solid idea of it. Um, aside from reproducing your own builds, uh, checking your upstreams is, I think, an area which, uh, where a lot of like, interesting problems are still to be solved. Uh, this is very, very much depends on what kind of project you have, what kind of build tools you, uh, you use. Um, so all the libraries you depend on, ideally, you would check that they can be reproduced, but how would you do that? Um, on the other side of this coin, um, empower your downstreams, so make it easy for your, the, the users of your project to test for themselves that they come to the same binary. Um, and if you're using a distribution, then definitely see if you can help your distribution uh, become more reproducible. So a ton of super interesting work to do, I think. Um, Reproduciblebuilds.org is sort of a central hub where a lot of this work comes together. Uh, but because, of, uh, because it's just a technique and not a technology, um, a lot of the work actually happens in the different ecosystems, so in different Linux distros, in different build tool uh, ecosystems. Uh, so definitely have a look there. Um, I will also make sure that the slides and the video are uh, uh, uploaded there. And with that, I would like to open up for questions. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, please line up in for the microphones in the middle. And please go close to the microphone that we can hear you properly. Front micro, please. Just, it's, try again. Test, 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 test. Yes. Ah, okay. There you are. That's better. OK, yeah, uh, thanks for that talk. Uh, you mentioned that the attack surface has been reduced significantly because now we cannot pressure GitHub uh, developers to check in malicious builds. However, they can still be forced to check in, let's say, a second line of go to fail, right? So, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, right. So um, you still have to audit the source code. You still uh, because, like in the pipeline, we're trusting the source code. Yeah. And uh, so to be able to trust it, you will have to audit it that there's no malware there. And assuming that you have done that, then the attack surface is reduced in the sense that the developer cannot have injected it later in the pipeline. All right. Yes. Uh, I have a second question. Yes, you can. Unless Someone else? Yeah, okay. yeah go on. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I don't want to be too pedantic there, <laughs> but uh, I, I saw at some point that you provided checksums as well, um, or that you computed checksums of the binaries. Yeah. Uh, what would be the reason to use MD5 or SHA1? Ah, in, in the ACA example, right. Um, because that's what people do uh, in the uh, Maven ecosystem. Um, they're not, so um, let me go back to that slide again. Yeah, there, there it was, I think. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so, so basically, um, basically that, that's not really part of the reproducible build story. Um, yeah, I, I think this is these are mainly there for legacy reasons, um, uh, because uh, just to check that the download didn't fail and stuff like that, and not for security reasons. Okay. Um, if you would create an attestation, uh, 
Um, so you sh ship some code and also you create an attestation that say, okay, I built this and the hash of the binary is this and this, then you would use a stronger hash like SHA-512 or uh, stuff like that. Definitely agree, yeah. Okay, good, thanks. Cool. And one last question, yes, please. So there are techniques to content address mm -hmm. and it does reproducibleBuilds.org, uh, are they interested in using that technology like I know Nix? has the Nix archive, and Nix wants to become content addressed, uh -huh. and uh, you know IPFS exists, and IPFS yep. has a format, uh, CAR, content mm -hmm. addressed archive. Yep. Uh, does reproducibleBuilds.org uh, find interest in this, and how is it going to use it in the future? Uh, so I think those two um, fit really well together, uh, but because the more reproducible build your project is, the more likely it, it is the uh, next build will have the same hash, and so the more likely it will be uh, you can, uh, you already have it and you don't have to look for it again. Um, I don't think reproducibleBuilds.org specifically wants to do something about uh, with it, it um, but I think, definitely think they play in each other's strengths. Yeah. Okay, then thank you very much for the interesting talk and please give a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>